Now that the dust has settled, or is on holiday, that's a weird image, I don't know what's wrong with me. It's high time we talked about the accents characters have in the popular, for a while, HBO show Game of Thrones. I'll do House of the Dragon once it's finished, which will still be long before Winds of Winter comes out. <laughs> You see, they're all over the bloody shop, the accents, and you might be able to get away with that stuff with the Yanks, but not over here, chum. You have Northerners with Southern accents, Southerners with Northern accents, Scots dropped in all over the place, and not a single Irishman, aside from Roos Bolton, who is, well, Mr. Umber here put it best. Your father was a cunt. Although he's still one of my favourite book characters. In this first chapter, I'm going to take a look at the North. Modelled fairly closely on the North of England and some of Scotland, most of the characters you see make a believable stab at sounding like they're from that region. Ned Stark still has his head attached at this point. Spoilers. Thus enabling to say things like Winter is coming. In his native Yorkshire accent. Kudos to D&D, or whoever told them it would be a good idea to have Ned and the Northerners sound like, well, Northerners. Something which isn't apparent in the books. Ned has the grim, earnest northernness down to a T, and as scene setting goes, it definitely helps build authenticity during the first episode of Game of Thrones. Jon Snow and Rob, so far, so northern. Don't think too much, Bran. Relax your bow arm. Reasonably good stab at the accent too, from a Scot and a southerner. Probably easier for a Scot, I guess. Roderick, the big barrel of sideburns, is also packing a no-nonsense northern accent. Lord Stark! My lady. The guardsman just rode in from the hills. Captured a deserter from the Night's Watch. Catelyn Stark has a weird Irish accent, but she's not from the north, so I guess that's excusable for the moment, since we haven't been shown what Riverlanders sound like. Ned. Ten is too young to see such things. Once we hear what Bran sounds like, things start to go wrong. You understand why I did it? John said he was a deserter. But do you understand why I had to kill him? Our way is the old way. Not a trace of the North. The real North. In his voice. Theon also sounds Northern, but he grew up with the Stark, so it's not beyond the realms of believability that he would sound like them. Well, like most of them. Right. Did you see it? No! Put away your blade. Take orders from your father, not you. Sansa sounds very, very southern. While Arya sounds like she's from Bristol. That's Jamie Lannister, the Queen's twin brother. Would you please shut up? Rickon sounds just as posh as Bran. Now come back with Mother. No, they won't. Uncle Benjin. Rides in with a northern accent, so big win for him. I got bigger. Road all day. Didn't want to leave you alone with the Lannisters. And Maester Lewin, I'll let off as Maesters can be from pretty much anywhere. Jory sounds sort of Scottish, but I guess we'll let that pass. We've met before, you know. Have we? Strange, I've forgotten. The Siege of Pike. Hodor sounded pretty northern back before he got mine bucked. Benjamin always lifts his chin when he's about to charge. And lowers it when he's going to dodge in a lady. <laughs> so that's the start. Let's take a look at some of the other northern houses. First up, the Umbers. Great John Umber might as well have a dire whippet down his trousers and be wearing a huge iron flat cap for how riotously northern he sounds as he bellows. There sits the only king. I mean to bend my knee to. The king of the north! Much later, we get Small John Umber, who's also authentically northern. Who owns the north? Freedom! Who owns the north? Freedom! Show me! Ned Umber only gets one line, and it's hard to hear, but we'll give him a pass. He sounds like he could be from up that way. Now and always. The cast Starks don't get much screen time, but they're relentlessly now, then. Lord Carstark really draws out his vowels and fits the north perfectly. We are King Stark and Car Stark. That didn't stop you from betraying me, and it won't save you now. I don't know what it to say. I wanted to hold you to the end of your days. 
Torrent caster doesn't get any lines apart from. But Harold has a good stab at the accent. We know where she's going. Her brother's at Castle Black. Ned Stark's last surviving son. Later we have Alice, who gets about as much dialogue as Ned, Umber. Now and always. And now the Boltons. Ugh. As I said, Bruce Bolton is one of my favourite book characters, and the actor portraying him on the show gives a decent interpretation. Theon but... holds the castle with a skeleton crew. Let me send word to my bastard at the Dreadfort. He can raise a few hundred men and retake Winterfell before the new moon. My god, where's he supposed to be from? He sounds like an Irishman who's lived in Islington for 20 years. Ramsay? Well, let's just say his accent hasn't changed a jot since he was Barry in Misfits. Welcome home, Lord Stark. Lock? I'm not sure what accent this is. Australian Cornish, maybe? Oh, nothing without you, Daddy. Your Daddy ain't here. Miranda sounds like she should be taking orders in a Knightsbridge restaurant. I like your dress. We made it for you. There's Lord Glover. Cup of coffee, darling. <laughs> Who seems to be channeling Great John Umber. Pleasure to watch. House Glover will stand behind House Stark as we have for a thousand years. And I will stand behind Jon Snow. The King in the North! Lord Kerwin pipes up at Jon's King of the North scene, and he sounds like he's from up that way, so have a big tick there. The Boltons are defeated. The war is over. Winter has come. And Lyanna Mormont giving it a decent go, much like Commander Mormont did. Your son was butchered at the Red Wedding, Lord Mandalay. It was meant for my son, Jorah. He brought dishonour to our house, but he had the grace to leave the sword before he fled from Westeros. Fuck knows why Jorah sounds the way he does. Just how long was he in exile for? I forfeited the right to claim this sword. It's yours. Lord Manderley, looking about a sixteenth the size he's made out to be in the books, also has a geographically authentic accent. My son died for Rob Stark, the young wolf. I didn't think we'd find another king in my lifetime. I didn't commit my men to your cause, because I didn't want more Manderleys dying for nothing. There's a smattering of other characters in the North, and to the show's credit, most of them sound like they could be from there. All D&D had to do was some basic googling or go on YouTube and type Northern Accent List. They probably assumed the Americans would get upset if there weren't more accents included that reminded them of Richard King Curtis films. Overall, I'm giving the North five severed direwolf heads out of seven. In part one of this series, I covered the North and remarked upon how many of the characters that hail from there sound like they're from anywhere but. In part two, it's time to take a look at the Stormlands. This one is tricky because George himself has compared it to medieval Germany with its dense forests and rocky regions. But I can't just do a video saying, no, he hasn't got a German accent. No, she hasn't got a German accent. So I will be examining each character's accent individually and comparing it to the others in that region. But FYI, they all fail through not having a German accent. Disclaimer. I'm only covering characters that were born or grew up in the kingdom being discussed, so there won't be any Davos, sorry Davos fans, or Stannis' wife. She has no fans, she barbecued her disabled daughter. King Bobby B. Let's save the best till first. The temptation here is to play a load of meme clips, but this is a serious discussion, so I will abstain. Bessie, thank the gods for Bessie and her tits. <laughs> There's no more wine. Is that what empty means? So get more. Stop this madness in the name of your As I was saying, King Robert Baratheon is blessed with a roaring northern accent to rival the Great John. 
How he acquired this can be explained reasonably well as owing to his close friendship and upbringing with Ned Stark when they were both fostered to John Aaron in the Vale. It's possible that Robert adapted his best friend's accent as his own, and to be honest, the first season would have been a lot poorer without it. Stannis the Manis Baratheon shares an earthy northern accent with his brother Robert. Kneel before me, lay your sword at my feet, pledge me your service and you'll rise again as John Stark, Lord of Winterfell. Which makes no sense at all as Stannis grew up in Storm's End, which as far as we know was a northern a free zone. Perhaps he went there on holiday as a youth and liked it so much he adopted the accent. Perhaps dear dear a pair of hacks who didn't really understand geography. We may never know. The youngest Baratheon sibling, Renly, sports a posh southern accent. This could be put down to him having grown up mostly at court in King's Landing and hanging around with the other posh shows such as Loras Tyrell and the Lannisters. I swear to you I will see the Lannisters answer for your husband's murder. When I take King's Landing, I'll bring you Joffrey's head. Stannis' daughter Shireen also sounds like she's from the south in a generic home counties kind of way. Mother said you fought in a battle. Did you win? No. Did the Onion Knight come back with you? Clearly didn't take after her uncle Robert. Her mother is from the Reach, who all sound incredibly posh aside from one I can think of. So there's that influence to consider too. Old Captain One-Eye himself, Lord Beric Dondarrion, is apparently from the Stormlands. He sounds much the same as some of the others, being well-spoken and southern. You knew him? Of course I did. When he was hand, he sent me off hunting for the mountain. Your wildling friend told me the Red Woman brought you back. Thoris has brought me back six times. Missed the trick with the resurrection thing though, he could have picked a different accent every time he came back just to mess with people. Barristan the Cake Cutter Selmy. Lapses into Irish at times. Perhaps him, Catelyn, Roos and Peter all went to the same nursery school. Mostly has a southern accent, as befits a king guard from the south. Life is strange. Not so many years ago we fought as enemies of the Trident. I'm glad we never met on the field, Sir Barristan. As is my wife. I don't think the widow's life would suit her. <laughs> You're too modest. I've seen you cut down a dozen great knights. Brienne Tarth, or Brienne of Tarth, always annoyed me that. I mean, her surname's the same as her birthplace. You don't get that really with any other characters. Did George run out of names? Unlikely, considering he gave us Dick on Man Woody. Anyway, Brienne speaks in a very posh southern accent, much like Renly. Why would you see that? In my experience, girls like I don't think you know many girls like her. Merrin Trant, slapper of little girls and a connoisseur of little girls. Too old. Speaks with a fairly highborn sounding accent. People love their king. They know who keeps them fed. That is until Arya catches up with him. Aye aye. Davos's fanatical son Mathos grew up in the Stormlands and speaks with a southern accent. This war isn't about you. We're not attacking King's Landing so that you can rape the Queen. I'm not going to rape her, I'm going to fuck her. Mostly using it to praise the Lord of Light and presumably to go, oh shit, when his ship exploded that time. All in all, the majority accent of the Stormlands, based purely on characters in the show that hail from there, seems to be predominantly Southern English sounding, so I'm going toward the Stormlands. Six burnt scaly princesses out of seven. In my previous videos on Game of Thrones, the initially popular HBO series about incest, dragons and rapidly aging children, I covered the accents of the North and the Stormlands. Now for the third part. You're going to do all seven of the fuckers? It's time for the Westerlands. Based mostly on southern England, culturally, if not geographically. So we'll just go with posh sounding English off the bat. I'm sure you'll tell me how wrong I am in the comments, and that is, of course, you're right. Up first is, of course, the Lannisters, and we'll start from the top, Lord Tywin himself. Now, he might have problems pronouncing Tyrell correctly. The Tyrells are a problem. 
Tyrells helped us defeat Stannis Baratheon. But as cold partial authority goes, he has the accent licked. Not that big a stretch for Charles Dance, you might argue, but honestly, who could be better cast as Tywin? Who else could add dignity to getting killed on the shitter? Jamie starts off a bit wonky. His voice veers into the actor's Danish accent a good amount during the first few seasons. Let me thank you ahead of time. You're guarding us all from the perils beyond the wall. Wildlings and white walkers and whatnot. But by the end he sounds more or less like a posh upper class type. So, fair play. You don't need a king. Any knight can make another knight. I'll prove it. Cersei sounds just as highborn and evil as any Disney villain. Yeah. I wanted to see your face. They said you'd lost your nose, but it's not as gruesome as all that. Even when she's angry, she maintains the RP accent. Take him! Take him! Take him! Take him! Tyrion. Now, there's no nice way of putting this, but Tyrion's accent is f***ing awful. I have a gift for you. Give that to your saddler. He'll provide the rest. You must shape the horse to the rider. You start with a yearling and teach it to respond to the reins and to the boy's voice. I don't remember him sounding this terrible when he was in Narnia. You get treated like a dumb animal long enough. That's what you become. You may find Narnia a more savage place than you remember. In scenes such as this one with Janos Slint, he does a competent job. Are you drunk? Not have my honor questioned by an imp? I'm not questioning your honor, Lord Janus. I'm denying its existence. For anything requiring emotion, he might as well be yelling to get served at a New Jersey bar. Archers! Archers! There are too many. Hound form a welcome party for any Baratheon troop that manages to touch solid ground. I'm not going to include Joffrey, Marcella, and Tommen here as they were born in King's Landing, so that will be another video. But there are still plenty of Lannisters to go around. They breed like incestuous rabbits. That should be on their coat of arms instead of the lions. Uncle Kevin, sorry Kevan, has a decent sounding upper class English accent, with some gravitas for the scenes where he has to tell off Cersei. I return to the capital to pay my respects to my brother, and to you, and to serve the king. I did not return to the capital to serve as your puppet, to watch you stack the small council with sycophants. Lancel Lannister has a nicely observed Weasley posh voice, which is perfect for a character that beds his cousin and murders a king for her. Her Grace the Queen Regent commands you to release Grand Maester Pycelle. Here's your warrant. Willem and Tommen, I mean Martin Lannister, didn't have an easy time of it. First they get told they're going to get eaten by Rob. And he eats the flesh of his enemies. Then they get stabbed up by an enraged hobo Santa. But they did sound the part while alive. It's Willem. Is this a rescue? Alton Lannister had the opportunity to simp directly at Jamie while they shared a cage together before having the honour of being murdered by him. His accent slips into Northern at times. I guess his brief conversations with Rob rubbed off on him. You'll get the Starks our reply, cousin. I will, your grace. Did you see my brother when you were the Starks guest? I did. They have not broken his spirit, your grace. The Cleganes now, and oh dear. Sander is full on Scottish. He might as well be wearing a kilt and asking for iron brew instead of wine. Look at me. Stannis is a killer. The Lannisters are killers. Your father was a killer. Your brother is a killer. Your sons will be killers someday. I'm not sure if he had a gap year up north or beyond the wall before he joined the Lannister's service, but it doesn't fit where he grew up. Gregor? Well, which one? The first Gregor Clegane only got one line, and sounded southern Englishy, I guess. The second, also known as the toothpick that rides, had the voice down at least. I want them dead, every one. Killing them isn't the problem. 
It's finding them. Have you gone soft, Clegane? The third was Icelandic, and while it may have been amusing to hear him say the dialogue, he was sensibly dubbed over by someone who sounded pretty much like the first guy, so a win, I guess. Elia marked out! I killed her children! Then I raped her! Then I smashed her head in like this! The Tickler, that nice chap who tortures imbecilic peasants, comes equipped with... Well, it's definitely an accent. Where is the Brotherhood? I don't know, please. Where is the Brotherhood? I don't know. <laughs> Anyone? Cornish? Irish? Pirate? Fuck knows. Polliver, when he runs his... A cunt mouth. Speaks with what starts as an East End sounding accent before lapsing into whatever this is supposed to be. He's good, the mountain is. Best at what he does, but... Torture, 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 torture. You spend enough time putting the hammer to people, you start to feel like a carpenter making chairs. Then he gurgles in an undefined tone. <laughs> uh. Amory Lorch, the illiterate crow kebabber, speaks with a posh-ish English accent, but on closer listen there are traces of Irish. What might this be? Lord Tyrone gave it to me. What for? To take to the armory. Why would he do that? Ill in pain. I just put him in as a joke. As we all know, he lost his tongue by going down on the Mad King's wife. Podrick Payne, the whoremaster. Everybody's least favourite puppy dog sidekick has a reasonable go at the southern accent sported by most of the other Westerlanders, but the occasional Scottish sound can be heard. What exactly did you do for Lord Tyrone? I brought him his meals, cleared his table when he was finished, kept his clothing and linens clean, carried his messages and returned the replies. Mostly I poured wine. Cersei's childhood friend Milara Heatherspoon which sounds like she should be teaching fucking potions or something at Hogwarts, has a generic child actor RP accent, as most of the kids in the show tend to. Why not? If your father... He'll, he'll never know we're gone. But if he finds out... Kudos to the girl that played young Cersei, though. She nailed the mannerisms and the voice. They said that you were terrifying. With cat's teeth and three eyes. You're not terrifying. Maggie the Frog has a sort of bored malevolence that she conveys through a suitable voice and seems like she's around those parts. Everyone wants to know their future. Until they know their future. This Lannister soldier that gets his legs sawed off by Talisa sounds sort of middle England. No, don't! No, don't! Please, don't! It'll get better! It doesn't even hurt! Before the screams begin. It's better than biting your own tongue, believe me. <laughs> And lastly, we have these two Burks with their immersion breaking conversation where they play top trumps with famous Westerosi swordsmen. Right. The mountain. Our man Jamie. If he ever gets out. Loris Terrell. Loris Terrell. He's prettier than the Queen. I don't care about pretty. He's better with a sword than any of them. I guess they sound like they were born and grew up in the Westerlands. So overall, another success for the show, so I'm awarding the Westerlands six tickled ticklers out of seven. In this ongoing series, I'm attempting to analyse each of HBO's Game of Thrones Seven Kingdoms by accent. So far, we've had the North, mostly Northern with some light Irish, the Stormlands, mostly Southern with a dusting of the North, and the Westerlands, mostly cunts. This time, it's the turn of Dawn, home of Snecks, Sulking, and shitty character interpretations. Based, according to George, on southern Spain, with some arguably Moroccan influences, Dawn is the hot part of Westeros that was never officially conquered, they just sort of got badgered into joining the Seven Kingdoms. There aren't that many Dornish characters in the show, sadly, but that might change with House of the Dragon. It's also a crime we never got Gerald Darkstar Dane, the character with more edges than the Iron Throne. House Martell is the main authority in Dawn, so we'll start with the main man, Dr. Bashir. I mean, Dr. Martell. Doran Martell. Nothing. Oberyn was slain during a trial by combat by law that is no murder. 
Doran seems to veer between a Spanish and TV Arabic accent. He does a competent job though, and what little we see of him, we get a good sense of the turmoil within the character. Prince Oberyn Martell. Well, he seems to be channeling Inigo Montoya at times. I'm going to hear you confess before you die. You raped my sister. You murdered her. You killed her children. Say it now and we can make this quick. Yeah. Hello. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Generally a sort of nondescript Spanish accent. Prince Oberyn. I don't believe you have met Elaria. This is the Lord Han, Tywin Lannister, and Cersei Lannister, the Queen Regent. I suppose it is former Queen Regent now. Suits the character brilliantly though, and Pedro really seems to be enjoying himself with each word. The venom, no pun intended, that he spits at the mountain before spearing him is intense. You killed her children! <laughs> Shame he didn't know when to shut up and take the win. Elaria Sand, she of the poison kiss and careless destruction of expensive wine, has a nice scenery chewing line in evil accented Spanish. You're not a Danish man. You're not our prince. My son. Just stay not. Your son is weak, just like you. And weak men will never rule Dorn again. She also knows how to make herself heard through a gag. No wonder Oberyn likes her so much, the kinky git. Tristan Martell now, and well, he's a bit of a wet lettuce. I have learned the value of mercy from my father. I'll set your man free. You're a good man. On one condition. Just doing a by the numbers generic Mediterranean accent to get his paycheck before being killed off by his family in revenge for the Lannisters killing their family. Yeah. And now things all start to get a bit Manuel. The Sand Snicks. Obara, Nymeria, and Tyen. I was going to cover each of them individually, but I can't. They don't deserve it. Never has a group of characters united a fan base in hatred quite like these fucking clowns. From the cringe dialogue. You want a good girl, but you need a bad pussy. To the embarrassing tough girl posturing, they just suck ass. For Oberyn. For, For Oberyn. Oberyn. The accents are kind of passable to be fair to the actresses though. Now let's watch them die for lols. Dane. I mean, he doesn't look much like the other Dornish characters, but I guess Starfell is right by the Reach border. So Arthur, the jewel-wielding anime knight, don't hit the camera, man. Dual wield. Speaks with a deep RP accent. Lord Stark. I looked for you on the Trident. And we went there. The actor actually does a great job with the accent and the role, particularly this look of pure hatred he shoots Ned before getting finished off. <laughs> Dornish soldiers. The prince's health forces him to remain at Sunspear. The few Dornish soldiers we see during Jamie and Bronze high school road trip sound about as generic foreign as you'd expect. Who are you? Cooper. This is Darnell. You're from King's Landing. Action gave me away. Honestly, the show really fucked up Dawn in general. Anyway, based purely on accents and rather begrudgingly, I have to award Dawn seven popped princes out of seven. 
We've been north, south, east and west, but now it's time to plunge into the middle of Westeros and pick apart the accents of the Riverlands and the Iron Islands. They're all one kingdom, you see, apparently. Starting with the Riverlands, I guess loosely based on the Midlands of England, we have House Tully. Boiler alert, none of them have Brummy accents. Americans have only just discovered northern people, so let's not rush them. Hoster Tully is ill at the start of the show and later becomes dead. He doesn't get any lines, but he does make a pleasant crackling sound like a bonfire on a late autumn afternoon. Brendan the Blackfish Tully is a gruff, badass old man who could chide his nephew. You shut your mouth about that damn mill. I don't call him nephew. He's your king. And walk away after firing an arrow without even waiting to see if it landed. He has a sort of southern accent with a tinge of somewhere else. Possibly Scotland. Maybe Ireland. Edmund Tully. He's my nephew. I love him. And he's a damn fool. Edmer is a sort of wet fish. He doesn't exude much power or intelligence, and in the show becomes a walking joke by the end. I like to think my experience has led to some small skill in statecraft and Uncle. an understand. Please sit. He speaks with an RP accent. Catelyn I covered in the first video in the series, but on reflection I probably should have waited for this one. Her sister Lyssa, however, speaks with a sort of posh, unhinged voice with a touch of Scottish here and there. My sister's guest is weary. Take him down below so he can rest. Introduce him to Maud. The innkeeper woman at the inn at the crossroads sounds a bit too upper class for a random peasant, but it is what it is. If I don't require a large room. Surely, my lord. We have nothing. This farmer who takes in the hound and aria and then gets punched and robbed is also a bit too well spoken. The gods will have their vengeance. Frey will burn in the seventh hell for what he did. Things were different when Hoster Tully ruled the Riverlands. Curliquet, for it is his name, a knight of the house Bracken, sounds Dutch or something if you ask me. A lord is honoured by his trust. Jonas Bracken, for some reason, has a roaring Irish accent despite living in the Riverlands. Take fealty to King Renly and move south to join our forces with his. There's this bloke, the Tickler Tickles. Please stop, please. It's started to hell. When he's not screaming, he sounds pretty estuary. This old woman who's just finished listening to her son being tickled to death sounds remarkably well spoken for a peasant. He was my son. My sister was three days ago. My husband the day before that. Clearly a travelling elocution teacher has been touring the Riverlands for some time. And this random Harren Hall night sounds like everybody else in the inn, aside from one. She is. Since Bronn has no actual backstory on where he's from, we might as well include him here. But don't go looking for me to bend the knee and the lord you every time you take a shit. I'm not your toady, and I'm not your friend. Speaks with a northern accent, so maybe he's from up there. Christ only knows. And who could forget this simpering farmer and his overacting display when he begs Ned Stark to do something about the mountain being naughty in the Riverlands? When they was done, they butchered them as if they was animals. They covered our children in pitch and lit them on fire. Why does he sound so northern? And this other farmer, the Hound and Aria chance upon. You shouldn't be sitting out here like this. Where else to sit? Tried to walk back to me hut. Had too much. Then I remember they burnt me hut down. He also sounds like he owns a whippet and holds his pint of bitter like this. Now onto the biggest wankers in Westeros. No, not the Silent Sisters. The Freys. From their stupid hats to being more inbred than the average British town, House Frey have done some despicable things. Walder Frey, the bed-shitting old patriarch, speaks with a croaky RP accent. You see that? Fifty inches. A little flower. And the honey's all mine. Deliciously evil and bitter sounding, you can tell the actor thoroughly enjoyed the role. 
He should definitely play Prince Philip should the opportunity arise. His heir, Stevron Frey, gets one line and he sounds simpering and posh. What am I supposed to do with you? Uh, father, you forget yourself. The same could be said of Ryger Rivers, who gets short shrift for daring to pipe up during negotiations with Kathleen. Father, please. I need lessons in courtesy from you, bastard. Your mother will still be a milkmaid if I hadn't squirted you into her belly. Lothar Frey and Black Walder might as well be the same character as far as the show is concerned, right down to their matching tea cosy hats and northern accents. We rode to crawling with cutthroats and bandits. When the King of the North summons us, we go. Our fathers instructed us to tell you that his alliance with the North can continue if his turns are met. Taking a look at the map of the twins, they are kind of on the border with the North, so we'll give them a pass, I suppose. Mary Frey here gets an awkward line when she has to correct the old bastard for getting her name wrong three times. I'm Mary. Fine. Rosalind Frey, who seems to have avoided all the ugly branches on the tree that the other Freys hit, has her line spoken over by this damn fool. Father Smith Warrior. Mother Maiden Crone Stranger. But we can get a hint of posh southern. Lord Edmure. I hope I'm not a disappointment to you. Walder Frey slash Bolton meets an unfortunate end. Ramsay, please. I'll leave Winterfell. I'll go back to the Riverlands. <laughs> The Frey Knight, who helps Catelyn capture Tyrion, has the same sort of Irish twang the Tickler had. The Twin Towers of Frey. How fares your lord, sir? Lord Walder as well, my lady. He has asked your father for the honour of his presence on his 90th name day. He plans to take another wife. Oh. Another northern sounding bloke stops the hound and is very rude to him, in my opinion. Are you soft in the head? Turn this car around. There's Mr. Ah, it's over. It's over yet, is it? Aye, it's over. <laughs> Another northerner. The rest of the phrase gurgle in various accents when they get mass murdered by Arya. <laughs> now for the Iron Islands. Based somewhat on the Viking lands of old, most people that live here don't sound like that at all. Starting with head honcho Balon Greyjoy, he's from the same moustache twirling posh villain school that Walder Frey attended. I brought you a proposal from Rob Stark. Who gave you those clothes? Was it Ned Stark's pleasure to make you his daughter? A very strong performance and very, very evil sounding. Theon I covered in the first video, northern accent and all. Yara, or Asha in the book, speaks with a very posh southern accent for some unknown reason. How did you get past the guards? Anything with a cock is easy to fool. My dear. Maybe Balon sent her to a finishing school in the Reach. Euron Greyjoy is a dark mysterious warlock pirate in the books. Here he's a bumbling clown who can build a fleet of ships on a barren island in a matter of days. Go back to your homes. Chop down every tree you can find. He does, however, have the only Scandinavian accent in the entire place. How's that for some Iron Islands irony? Aaron Damphair Greyjoy speaks with a southern accent. Let Euron, your servant, be born again from the sea as you were. Bless him with salt. Bless him with stone. Bless him with steel. He has a great voice, in my opinion, and was wasted on just this one scene. This fake Aaron in season two speaks with a full on Irish accent. What is dead may never die. What rises again, Rada. Dagmar is just Finchy from the office with leather armor on. Dagmar, first my hand. That's not to detract from the performance, however, as he plays the role to a T. Thought he'd never shut up. It was a good speech. Didn't want to interrupt. Black Lauren here, the very insubordinate member of Theon's crew. Your captain. <laughs> <laughs> I have been reaving and raping since before you left Balon's balls, Captain. Speaks with a Scottish accent. 
At this point, just go with it. Drennan, another Irishman. And where are you going? He doesn't get many lines before he gets killed by horniness. Harag, who tragically attempts to kick Theon in the balls, is a swaggering Australian. Your sister's dead. She's not dead. She's dead. Even if Euron hasn't cut her throat yet, she's dead. She's our queen. She's your sister, and you left her to die. Ralph Kenning is incredibly posh. <laughs> Are you a woman, boy? You don't know. The Iron Born will not surrender. He's cut off mid bullying of Theon by Adrak Humble. There's a fierce of Iron name. If we yield, we live. Is that what he says on this paper here? Who sounds like he'd be at home selling you car insurance on a daytime TV ad. For the Riverlands, I'm awarding the show four missed arrows by a damned fool out of seven. For the Iron Islands, two fingers in the bum out of seven. In part six of this ongoing series, examining the accents of the Seven Kingdoms in HBO's Game of Thrones, I thought it was high time I covered the veil vale and the various idiots and pompous windbags that populate it. Based on, oh, who honestly cares anymore? Switzerland or somewhere. None of them have Swiss accents either, so they all lose. On we go. Lord Robin Aaron, the sickly mummy's boy in charge of the Vale of Aaron, is sort of Diet Joffrey in many ways. <laughs> Coddling mother. Family means everything to me. Sociopathic tendencies. and the total inability to take a slap. He speaks with a sort of RP accent with some estuary thrown in. She's my cousin. We should help her. Sir Hugh of the Vale gives Jory short shrift when he's approached on Ned's behalf. As you can see, I'm busy. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, sir. Sounds suitably snidey and posh, and later sounds gurgly and spluttering. Sir Vardis, the cocky, sure of himself captain of the guard that gets chucked down the moon door by Bronn, sounds like, well, your guess is as good as mine. Cornish? Irish? With all my heart, my lady. But the imp is half my size. Shameful to slaughter such a man and call it justice. No information on where the actor is from seems to be available anywhere either. This chap guarding the bloody gate gets, well, not quite the response he was expecting when he informs the Hound and Arya that Lady Psycho of the Vale has passed on. Then I offer my condolences. Lady Aaron died. Three days ago. <laughs> Southern with a twinge of what sounds like Welsh. The delightfully pompous Lord Royce has the measure of Littlefinger from the get-go and has a wonderful old-school posh accent. And she's fallen through the moon door. We were told there was a witness, a girl. His son Waymer has the honour of being the first character to die in the show. He speaks with a posh accent similar to his father. One not steals a goat from another lot before you know it they're ripping each other to pieces lady anya wainwood she of the zuma haircut and old woman on a bus scowl has a posh accent such as you might imagine a duchess having rob stark is dead who would you have us back lord bailey robin aaron is a sickly little boy so vance corbury gets one line during littlefinger's interrogation your secret is safe with us my he has a calm voice like a vicar or a Radio 4 presenter. This Knight of the Vale accompanying Littlefinger and Sansa gets one cool line before Brienne takes him out. Sounds upper middle class-ish. Guess that means you're unarmed. <laughs> Maud, the jailer of the Eyrie, is a repellent brute with the sort of cockney accent that we definitely should have heard more of in this show. Especially in scenes set in King's Landing. You got sneak talk now. So Mandon Moore, before he was dispatched by Pod, spoke with an Irish accent despite being from the Vale. The lads caught a groom and two maids trying to sneak away with a stolen horse and some gold cups. And lastly we have Shagger, leader of the Hill Tribes, played by established character actor Mark Lewis Jones, whose accent is similar to Letho from The Witcher games, who he also voiced. 
but without the American twang. When you meet your gods, you tell them Shaga, son of Dolph, of the Stone Crow sent you. Not a bad turnout from the Vale, so I'll be awarding it five slapped sweet robins out of seven. <coughs> Next time it'll be the Reach featuring Samuel Tarley. Yeah, and I can't wait. Well, we've done it. We've arrived at the seventh, but not the last, part of this series, examining the accents of each of the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros, as heard in the HBO show Game of Thrones. Now it's time for the accents of the Reach, which is a very posh, prosperous place, starting with the people's princess, Marjorie Tyrell. Marjorie speaks with an incredibly posh accent and wears a permanent smirk on her face. Even when she's annoyed, she remains well-spoken and correct-sounding. Bad men wanted to come into this city and do terrible things, but your father stopped them. Olena Tyrell, the wily old battle axe matriarch of House Tyrell, is just as witty and waspish as she is in the books. It was treason. I warned them. Robert has two sons and Renly has an older brother. How can he possibly have any claim to that ugly iron chair? Spot on performance by Diana Rigg, she gets some wonderful lines. It's done. It is. And now the rains weep o'er our halls. Mace Tyrell is a bumbling, pompous oaf with an excellent singing voice. So give me a kiss by the long canal, and give me two kisses in salty town. He's never happier than when he has his tongue jammed right up Tywin's golden behind. Lord Tyrell, be a good man. Fetch my quill and paper. Loras Tyrell has the sort of lazy posh accent of one who's never had to really try in life. Your sister looks very beautiful. As does yours. So, are you looking forward to your wedding? Yes, very much. Our fathers are both rather keen on the prospect. <laughs> they certainly are. This Tyrell lady in waiting to Elena sounds oddly northern. Jack Bulwer, the member of the Night's Watch, who correctly guesses this charming young lady's rendition of a popular song, also sounds weirdly northern, despite being from the Reach. <laughs> the Tyrell servant, who dares to question Lady Elena on when the cheese will be served, at least sounds posh enough to be from the Reach. The cheese will be served after the cakes, my lady. The cheese will be served when I want it served. Marjorie Tyrell's handmaiden, who is deeply concerned that her ladyship will get peasant shit all over her dress, sounds very well spoken and RP. You'll ruin your dress. I have others. Gerald Hightower is the sure of himself commander of the Kingsguard in the era of the Mad King. Gets one good line. And we weren't there. Your friend the usurper would lie beneath the ground if we had been. Axel Florent brother of the deranged Celise, doesn't share his sister's newfound religious beliefs and is duly burnt alive for it. The family's own. Celise! Yours is the star of the Lord. You're my sister! Yours are the stars that guide us. Celise Florent is a wild-eyed fanatic who is happy to let a sexy red witch sleep with her husband Stannis. She sounds suitably deranged in a manner familiar to anyone who's ever been handed a Watchtower magazine at their doorstep. One morning, he shot two seagulls on the beach. I've never tasted anything as good as grilled seagull. <laughs> Melissa Florent, Celise's cousin, is married to Randall Tarley. She's well-spoken in a mumsy sort of way. Oh my. You are lovely. Randall Tarley is a belligerent old bastard in the vein of Alistair Thorne and he hates wildlings just as much, unfortunately, for his son, Sam. You're a wildling. The Seven Kingdoms have waged war against these savages for centuries, and here I sit, hosting one in my hall. 
Dickon Tarly has a sort of good-natured manner and speaks with an upper-middle-class accent. He even shows some dignity when mocked by this up-jumped cutthroat. It was glorious. Come on, your father's not here. All my life we've been pledged to house Tyrell. I knew some of those men. Tala Tarly is a slightly insipid posh girl who fusses over dresses and lives in fear of her father. Oh, and a dress for dinner. You can wear one of mine. What's your colour? In light blue or silver? Silver, maybe. Well, I think that's everyone. I can't think of anyone who I might have met. Swagger down the street with your red lips and funky beat. You better hold your head up to the sky. I'm gonna roll with you till the day I die. I know I've perhaps been a bit harsh on Samuel Tarly in the past, but he utterly deserves it, mostly due to his northern fucking accent. I know for a fact that some of the officers go to that brothel in Mole's town. I wouldn't doubt it. Well, don't you think it's a little bit unfair? Making us take our vows while they sneak off for a little sally on the side. He's from the Reach. We've just heard each of his family members speak. Did he stop off at a pie shop near Winterfell on his way to the wall and just adopt the accent immediately? This is basically the point I wanted to make when I began this series. If you're making a rough geographical equivalent to Britain in your medieval fantasy show and you're willing to make different characters have different accents corresponding to where they're from, they don't half arse it. Or this is the result. Overall, I'll be awarding the reach. Six slaying Sams out of seven. Thank you for being with me this far. In future videos, I'll be covering the accents and speech patterns of other areas of Westeros such as the Crown Lands and the Wall, in addition to taking a look overseas at Essos and its many cultures. Now we have the Seven Kingdoms proper out of the way, we can take a look at some of the other areas of Westeros. The Crown Lands technically doesn't fall under any of the other kingdoms, so I thought why not give it its own video. Joffrey Baratheon, the slimy Westeros supervillain and false king, speaks with a posh evil southern accent, somewhere between Mr Burns and Commodus from Gladiator. It's not much at all. Please, have another cup. You sure, Your Grace? Yes. To celebrate my name day. Have two, have as much as you like. His brother Tommen, the grown-up version, speaks with a very posh RP accent befitting other royals such as Joffrey or Renly. My mother would like to see her daughter's final resting place. Oh, I'm sorry, Your Grace. That's not possible. Not yet. When will it be possible? When she's fully atoned for her sins. You cut off her hair and marched her naked through the streets in front of the whole city. Marcella Baratheon's an odd one. As a child, she seemed to have a northern twang, but the later version spoke with an accent much like her siblings. I know. About you and Mother. I think a part of me always knew. And I'm glad. More D&D &D continuity fails. Davos Seaworth is as Geordie as they come, despite hailing from Flea Bottom in King's Landing, in the south. You're not a young man, Salador. And correct me if I'm wrong, most pirates don't grow old. A note for our American viewers, Geordie means from Newcastle. If you've ever had the misfortune of seeing these woeful, well past their prime idiots on your screens, then that's the Geordie accent. Sir Dontus of House Hollard, despite his house colours seeming to be the American flag, Sir Dontus, the lovable drunken clown, speaks with an estuary accent. Sorry, Your Grace. Uh, my deepest apologies. That's when he's not spluttering wide everywhere in front of the royal family. Lollis Stokeworth is so wet she should be the sigil of House Tully, but she sounds posher than most of the other characters on the show. Fair play to the actress for giving it her all in her one scene. What is the most important thing, don't you agree? We're going to need pigeon pies. That's what they eat in the capital, don't they? Don't they? Janos Slint, the stalwart, trustworthy captain of the Gold Cloak, speaks with what seems to be a southern accent, but we get some scouse creeping in. Are you drunk? Not have my honour questioned by an imp? Scouse is what people from Liverpool sound like. You know, like the Beatles, or if you hate your life, Google Scylla Black. Megan, the mother of one of Bobby B's many, many bastard children, sounds a bit too well-spoken and RP for your average King's Landing prostitute. 
He wasn't that sort of man, my lord. He just wanted to know if the child was happy, healthy. Gendry, the blacksmith's apprentice and wielder of a ridiculous fantasy warhammer, speaks with an estuary accent. About my work, first. I was being treated well. I liked it here. His blacksmith master speaks with a nondescript southern accent. As you wish, my lord. Gendry! Olivar, the male prostitute, seems to be the only gay man in King's Landing, lending his services to Oberyn, Loras, and the High Septon, amongst others. Speaks in a plummy RP accent. Hey. Oliver, is it pleasing? I should like to see you sparring for a partner, <laughs> sir. The fat boy that Arya kills has his lines dubbed in for some reason. Standard southern child actor voice. There she is. What do you want? Want you, wolf girl. Come here. Leave me be. My father's a lord. He'll reward you. She'll reward me. The queen. Stay away! Hot Pie sounds like he could be from 1980's Grange Hill with his estuary TV accent. What's a gutter rat like you doing with a sword? Maybe he's a little squire. He ain't no squire. Look at him. He looks like a girl. Lommy, another orphan from King's Landing, speaks much the same way as Hot Pie up until he gets a needle in the neck. You've got to carry me. All right. Rorge's origin is unknown, but we first meet him being transported to the wall from King's Landing. Speaks in a gruff Cockney accent reminiscent of Bill Sykes from the various Oliver Twist films. Get us beer! Viserys Targaryen sounds as posh and evil as Joffrey. I can see why he was killed off early, you can't have two of them running around. Is it true they lie with their horses? I wouldn't ask Carl Drogo. If you take me for a fool, I take you for a king. Daenerys Targaryen sounds very upper class. Must have had some expensive governesses while in exile. We will lay siege to the capital surrounding the city on all sides. Cersei will have the Iron Throne, but no food for her army or the people. Rhaegar Targaryen gets few lines in a flashback, but he sounds like royalty. She is mine. From this day until the end of my days. Cersei's handmaiden, Bernadette, not only copies her grace's Mr. Spock haircut, but also her accent, or tries to. Advance your grace. The head pyromancer has a great voice like a wizened old sorcerer. The actor used to do the audiobooks, and they're definitely worth checking out. No, I have not conducted this experiment. It, it could well be true. The substance burns so hot. It melts wood, stone, even steel. High Septon won before having his arm ripped off by starving city folk spoke in a pompous, posh accent reminiscent of Mace Tyrell. May the give her wisdom. May the warrior give her courage. His successor was much the same, if not a tad more pious sounding. As the High Septon of the Faith of the Seven, I give voice to the will of the gods and am their foremost servant in this world. An insult to me is an insult to the gods. An assault on my person is an assault on our very religion. You were assaulted. I was, by those fanatics who call themselves sparrows. The High Sparrow speaks in an upper-class RP accent as befitting a man who has basically become the Pope of this setting. The gods' judgment is fierce, but also fair. Overall, I am awarding the Crown Lands a well-deserved Seven King's Landings out of seven. Join me next time for more of this enjoyable nonsense when we cover the Citadel and the Maesters in general. In this series, examining the accents of Westeros as featured in the TV show, well, you know the drill by now. This week, it's time to have a look at the Maesters, those weird, probably celibate raven wranglers who seem to hold a high seat of office in every major city and castle in the land. Maester Aemon Targaryen, the erstwhile heir to the throne and brother of Egg from the Duncan Egg stories, is a very old man who has been Maester of the Night's Watch seemingly forever. He speaks with a faltering RP accent. But when I heard they had killed my brother's son and his poor son and the children, even the little children. Who are you? Grand Maester Pycelle, a conniving old sod that has a major hard-on for both House Lannister and Ladies of the Night, speaks in an affected old man at RP voice most of the time. 
except when he feels the need to drop the act, then he sounds much more sure of himself. Never! Look, it's a falsehood! I swear it! It wasn't me! These are your new chambers. A little cramped, perhaps, but you don't need much room, do you? Maester Lewin of Winterfell is a kindly old man who tutors Bran and has a nice line in dry humour when it comes to Theon. Also speaks in an RP accent. Notice a theme starting to build here. Words we do not say. Lords? The Greyjoys. Banes for their skills at archery, navigation and lovemaking. <laughs> and failed rebellions. Maester Cresson has a wonderful voice. Yes, it's RP and it's a shame we don't see more of him. Since that boar killed his brother, every lord wants a coronation. I don't serve the others. I serve Stannis. As do I. But loyal service means telling hard truths. Maester Walken has his good mood cut short when Ramsay rather rudely stabs his father Roos to death right in front of him. How did he die? Poisoned by his enemy. This citadel maester that gives Sam a hard time when he arrives is, I believe, dubbed over, as the actor is Danish. Feels off, and the voice actor they use sounds standardly posh. The archmaester will discuss these irregularities with you. In the meantime, you are permitted to use the library. Follow me. No women or children! Ebros, the Archmaester of the Citadel, is played by Jim Broadbent in super kindly mode. Well spoken southern accent. We are this world's memory, Samuel Tarly. Without us, men would be little better than dogs. Don't remember any meal but the last, can't see forward to any but the next. And every time you leave the house and shut the door, they howl like you're gone forever. Finally, we have Kyburn, the disgraced former maester and basically a necromancer in as much as this setting allows. Speaks in a kindly, very RP accent which he maintains whether he's tending to the injured or having people put to death. I have more important things to do with my time than waste them in Please, the presence. Please, Grand Maester, I bear you no ill will. Please forgive me if you can. Overall, I'm giving the maesters six lanced Lewins out of seven. I'm docking a point for the weird dubbing job they did with the Citadel Maester. Join me next time when we'll be casting a critical eye at the wall and those brave fellows that man it. For the final part of the accents of Westeros, before I start to look overseas at Essos and beyond, it's time to analyse the accents of the Night's Watch. Well, the ones I haven't previously covered, and the Wildlings. Along with some of the general peasants that live near the wall. To begin, we have Alyssa Thorne. Gruff and surly, Alyssa doesn't seem to enjoy being in the Night's Watch very much. Despite hailing from the Crownlands, he speaks with a northern accent tinged with a touch of Welsh. Eating the horses was easy. But later when we started to fall, that wasn't easy. Dolorous Ed is miserable and world-weary. He hails from the Vale, but sounds like he's from the North. There must be a magical force field that turns people northern as soon as they travel past Moat Kaelin or somewhere. When the White Walkers came, you left me. Aye, we left you. You're fat and you're slow. We didn't want to die. Pip, or Piper, is from the Riverlands and does have a southern accent, so well done, show. You got something right. I got one. Right through the heart, he's dead. Oh, is it over? Mm. Well then. Gren is another northerner in accent, if nothing else, as we don't know where he hails from originally, aside from the fact he grew up on a farm. They get him up. Looks like that piggy is done for. Help us get him up. Slowing us down. Just get him up! Ollie was just having a nice day working with his dad before the wildlings slaughtered everyone in his village. Speaks with a northern accent. Telling the wildlings you want to make peace. You're just doing it to trick them. It's not a trick. They burnt my village. They put an arrow through my father's head. Ollie's dad was dreaming lustily of his wife's potatoes when he caught an arrow, ending his appetite and his life. Also speaks with a northern accent. 
potatoes. Well, no one boils a potato better than your mum. She got the. The horse ranch owner that Jon Snow fails to kill has an accent that's hard to place, but sounds roughly of the north, I suppose. Let me stand at least. Let me go with a bit of dignity. The woman named only as Moles Town Whore has a riotous Cockney accent for some unknown reason. Perhaps she travelled up with a relative heading to the wall and decided to stick around to make a quick buck or two. You hear me? Yes. Got anything to say? I'm sorry he woke you up. <laughs> I don't care if you're sorry. Carl fucking Tanner, who clearly states he is from Gin Alley in King's Landing, also has a northern accent. I was a fucking legend, Gin Alley. A fucking legend! Honestly, it gets so tiresome. Rast, the sensitive, gentle soul, doesn't have an official place of birth, but speaks with a northern accent, so fair enough there. I wouldn't stand a chance. None of us would. Othel Yarwick, well, you'll never guess what, he has a northern accent too. Unfortunately, he's from the Westerlands, where they don't sound like that. My mother's still living in White Harbour. Could you write it? Tell her I died fighting the wildlings. Bowen Marsh is from the neck, the boggy part of the north. Speaks with an appropriate accent. You shouldn't be alive. It's not right. Neither was killing me. Corin Halfhand is another Night's Watch member with no confirmed place of origin, and as such was given a northern accent on the show. There's a fire. People sitting around it have better eyes than yours or mine. When they see us coming, that fire becomes a signal. Mance Raider was born beyond the wall and taken in by the Night's Watch before rebelling. Speaks in a northern accent. So, you're Ned Stark's bastard. Thank you for the gift, Lord of Bones. You can leave us. Tormund Giantsbane, the wildling warrior who has a serious crush on Brienne, speaks with a Scandinavian accent, which is a nice touch given the geography of the area. Plenty of little men try to put their souls through my heart, and there's plenty of little skeletons buried in the woods. Rattleshirt, the Lord of Bones, had a northern accent in Season 2, but seems to have adopted the more common Scandinavian one in Season 5. Perhaps he was just pretending to impress Egret. We may never find out. We killed his friends. I thought we want to question this one. Last time I saw you, the little crow was your prisoner. The other way around now. One One the Giant gets a line for comedy effect, and I have no idea how to class it, so it will be designated Giant Ease. Don't you throw. Lobada, the surly Fen, speaks with a light Scandinavian accent. Keep your glass, King Crow. As soon as you get on his ships, they're gonna slit your throats and dump your bodies to the bottom of the shivering sea. Magnar of the Fen has a much more pronounced Scandinavian accent and makes for a very authentic performance. Build your parents. Open your eyes. I'm going to eat them. Oral, the warg and number one egret sib, speaks with a northern accent when he's not cawcawing in eagle form. The fist of the first man. What did you see? <laughs> Dead crows. Jon Snow's Stockholm Syndrome girlfriend egret has a northern accent and really likes using it. Last time you've seen a giant, Jon Snow. They're not there too long, they're shy. When they stop being shy, they get angry. Carsey, despite having a name that's slang for a toilet, certainly doesn't resemble one. Speaks in a Scandinavian accent. The show's really on a roll with a diversity of wildling accents. No sarcasm, it really is. I'll never trust a man in black. But I trust you, Torment. If you say this is the way, 
Craster, the miserable old prick who begrudgingly helps the Night's Watch at times, speaks in a roaring Welsh accent for some unknown reason. Nah. They're as strong as they're gonna get. Them that's dying. When you cut their throats and be done with it. I'll leave them if you've not the stomach. And I'll sort them myself. Gilly, Craster's daughter sounds very northern. How do you know all that? I read about it in a, a very old book. You know all that from staring at marks on paper. Leaf, the child of the forest, speaks with an eerie southern accent in season four, and then the recast version in season six sounds much more RP. He is lost. Come with me or die with him. Brandon Stark needs you. For what? I sit in there and I watch him have his visions and nothing ever happens. He isn't going to stay here forever. The Three-Eyed Raven is a standard posh bloke in Season 4, before being replaced by legendary actor Max von Sydow, who was allowed to use his native Swedish accent in Season 6. I've been many things. Now, I am what you see. I was waiting for you. I don't want to be you. <laughs> I don't blame you. You won't be here forever. Overall, I'm awarding the Night's Watch and the Wildlings seven fooked Carl Tanners out of seven. Sansa. 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 Well, you asked for it, so here we go. Peter Littlefinger Baelish is a Machiavellian mastermind in both the Song of Ice and Fire books and, well, the first five or six seasons of the show Game of Thrones, in which he is played by Aidan Gillen. However, that's not why we're here today. We're here today to rip the ever-loving piss out of Littlefinger's accent. Well, accents, as it goes. They seem to change and get more bizarre each season, you see. Season 1 Littlefinger sounds like this. Look at you. You know what you want me to do. You know it has to be done. But it's not honourable, so... the words stick in your throat. He sounds like he's reading his lines on a screen inside his head whilst also trying to sound English. I don't remember Mayor Carsetti sounding this stuttery. Later, when he backstabs Ned, he sounds thoroughly snaky like a Disney villain. I did warn you not to trust me. He also gets a long monologue scene, which is hilarious because of the voice he's acting, but I can't show that as it has boobies in it. You know the one. For many years, most of my life really, play with her ass. In season two, we start to get some Irish creeping into his voice. Ah, the late King Renly. <clears throat> Rather a short reign. Murdered by a woman, I hear. So they say. There has been talk of other forces Dark forces. I'm not sure if this was a decision on the actor's part or if even the tone-deaf David and Dan realised he sounded like an utter tool in season one. It's like he can't quite decide on what he wants the character to sound like or he's just taking the piss. Who knows? Season three and he's back to sounding English-ish again with some Irish on his R's, such as the famous Chaos is a Ladder scene. But what do we have left once we abandon the lie? Chaos. A gaping pit waiting to swallow us all. Chaos isn't a pit. Chaos is a ladder. Season 4 and we're in full-on raging Irish mode. He's clearly not even trying to sound like anything else at this point. Apologies, my lady. And to you as well, Baelish. We are uh, treated a bit harshly. You want justice, Lord Royce? I can hardly complain about that. I want the same. There's also the boat scene with Sansa where he sounds like he's trying to be Batman. Where are you taking me? I'm getting married to your Aunt Lysa. She's waiting for us at the Eyrie. You'll be safe there. Maybe his time spent with the big guy... For you. ...rubbed off on him. 
season five and we have him embracing the accent of a pirate of the high seas. It felt like the safest place. Not for your clientele, clearly. It was an establishment like no other. A sheer range of appetites catered to desires that didn't even exist until we invented them. Season 6's Littlefinger seems to have stabilised his accent now, more in keeping with Season 4. Whenever I consider an action, I ask myself, will this action help to make this picture a reality? Pull it out of my mind and into the world. In his last scene in Season 7, Peter seems to cycle through every accent he's ever had in the show, like the T-1000 cycling through all the faces it's used as it melts. It's truly a wonder to behold. Give me a chance to defend myself. I deserve that. I am Lord Protector of the Vale and I command you to escort me safely back to the Eyrie. I think not. Sansa. I beg you. I loved your mother since the time I was a boy. I loved you. More than anyone. The thing I don't get is why Aiden never used his real speaking voice. Here's how he sounds in real life. I really did enjoy playing that character and Game of Thrones and being part of that, you know, just spectacular um, story weaving that so many people you know, invested themselves in. That would have worked fine for the show. Overall, I'm going to award Peter Littlefinger one chaotic ladder out of seven. Bye then. Hello and sigh. Nobody is perfect, not even me dear viewer, and sometimes things get lost in the wash. Today I want to cover the characters I you kind of forgot about while doing my previous accents of Westeros videos. To start with, we have Roz, everybody's favourite hooker with a heart of, well, money. Roz has an earthy northern accent, which is great because she's from Winterfell. And you can afford that. Some of my friends are more generous than others. A thousand girls like you in King's Landing. So I'll have lots of company. Jojen Reed, another northerner, has a southern RP accent for some reason. You must be summer. Now, people have pointed out in the comments before that the noble houses may all share a sort of standardised accent, which is why so many of them sound southern. This does make a lot of sense. For a real-life example of this, take Rose Leslie, who plays Egret. She grew up in a castle in Scotland, yet speaks with a very posh English accent. Yeah, this is the accent that I've always had. So where are you from? Um, I'm, bizarrely enough, I'm actually from Scotland. Oh. No! Yeah! Mira Reed, Jojen's sister, also has a very well-spoken RP voice. You ashamed your brother, needing you to protect him. Where's the shame in that? Any boy his age who needs his sister to protect him is going to find himself needing lots of protecting. Some people will always need help. Scepter Onella, who managed the incredible task of glamming down Hannah Waddingham, speaks in a kind of RP meets estuary accent. She doesn't get many lines aside from shouting shame 500 times. I said my face would be the last thing you saw before you died, do you remember? Good. I'm glad to see your face. I'm ready to meet the gods. Angai the Archer, who hails from the Dornish border with the Stormland, speaks with a Liverpudlian accent. You know, like the Beatles. When I'm done talking, that arrow's falling down on your fat head. So I advise you move. Because I'm done talking. Marillion, the bard who paid a hefty price for singing a very funny song about King Robert getting cucked to death, speaks in an estuary accent that sounds a lot like David Tennant when he plays Doctor Who. He's Scottish in real life, so I guess that makes sense. Boy, bread, meat and beer, quickly. Oh, good idea, grandfather, I'm starving. A song, Bobby White? Lem Lemoncloak, who is much more of a twat in the show than he is in the book, speaks in a southern English accent. Stay safe. The night is dark and full of terrors. Brother Ray of House Lovejoy is a show-only character. He speaks in a northern accent, and there's no reason to assume he's not from up that way. I mean, these people don't know how to fight. You do. 
I'm done with fighting. Even if it's to protect yourself. Violence is a disease. Taylor, the little girl that reminds Davos of Shireen, is from Winterfell and speaks in a northern accent. Well done, show. All the children will be going below when the time comes. Lyanna Stark, both versions, speak in a northern accent, much like her siblings. Right here. And lastly, Old Nan. The old version and the slightly less old version both have area-appropriate voices. Ah, oh, Nan. Look at the size of him. If he ever learned to fight, he'd be unstoppable. Well, he's never going to learn to fight because he's a stable boy. <laughs> Don't listen to it. Crows are all liars. That's about it. Thanks as always, and I will see you in Essos next time. Bye then.